Good evening, Rabbi Friedman. How are you tonight? Excited about the future. Baruch Hashem. Thank God. That's good to hear. Okay. Tonight, uh, we are doing a YouTube Live in preparation for a wonderful course that we will be having, that will be coming in, in one week. So one week from tonight, Monday night, is the, will be the first part of our course. The course is titled Unlocking Your Potential for 2024. We all know that when it comes to New Year, we're all excited and uh, we want to do great things. And um, unfortunately, often yeah. comes the end of the year and we say, what did we accomplish? So we want to really get the uh, get in the ideas of what we need to do and how we need to think in order to make this year the best year yet. And I know that uh, you often give people blessings that this should be a memorable year that this should be uh, a year that people can look back and say 2024 was my best year. And I want to do that. They can do that for 2025 and continue growing from there. It doesn't have to end. But how do we get into the into the mindset of accomplishing, of growing, of making this our best year, our best year yet? That's what the course is basically going to be about. And of course, we have uh, Rabbi Friedman here that's going to be taking the lead. And um, we hope that all of you listening will come join us. And we're going to start, uh, we're going to do this uh, live Q&A. We're going to do some questions. People that are joining us on YouTube Live, they want to uh, share any questions or have any uh, comments for the rabbi, please go ahead and share that. And... Um, and we'll go from there. Got a lot of uh, suggestions are also welcome. Okay. Suggestions on what topics need to be discussed, what angles need to be considered. Input. Input is good. All right. All right. 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 Okay. I'm sharing the link to uh, to the rabbi's course. So uh, anyone that wants to join. Join the course can go ahead and uh, click that link. All right, we got some people from Beishana. You know that Beishana is going on right now, so we have some people there that are that are joining. Rabbi Friedman just got off his Zoom with the people of Beishana, and uh, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. So, Rabbi Friedman, let's start off with the uh, simple question that uh, that is that are coming in, and I know that we're going to discuss this more in the course, but uh, just to get it started. How do we know what is our uh, mission and how do we know what parts in our life are just distractions? Now, there is a good question to start with. Because if we don't know the answer to that, you can't even get started. So how to unlock our potential. The first question is why? Why do you want to unlock your potential? What if you're really a nasty person? You want to be as nasty as your potential will allow? What is our potential? How does anybody know what their potential is? Until you try, you don't know, right? Then we start making up stuff about ourselves. I do have potential, I don't have potential. You can fool yourself, you can deceive yourself. It's, it's a risky, it's a risky business there. Let's assume safely, everyone, everyone can do a little better than they're doing. That's a safe thing to say, no? Whatever I'm doing, I can do a little better. Whatever I'm doing, I can do a little more. That's not dangerous. That's not misleading. It's not wishful thinking. 
It's absolutely true. Whatever you're doing that's good, do a little more. You want to do a lot more? Fine. But at least you know where you're headed. You know you're good at something and you can do more of that. But to go looking for your potential, you end up wasting your life. And this happens very often to people. I've, I've never felt like I reached my potential. Your potential at what? I don't know. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that is the problem. All right, so what really is our objective and our goal? Ideally. Ideally, our objective, which is a necessary one, is to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. Now, that sounds very ambitious. And it may be. But it must be doable if that's what we were created for. You can't go wrong on that one. If God created you for a certain purpose, of course you can do that. So what is your potential? In the purpose for which God created you, there's a lot of potential. You can do a job 100%, you can do it 80%, you can do it 70%. But you know what it is you're doing, the purpose for which you were created. What is the purpose for which we were created? To serve God. That's a very broad statement. What exactly does it mean to serve God? Say, do his mitzvahs. Yeah, you can do his mitzvahs obediently. And that's obedient. Is that serving? Can you partner with God through obedience alone? Or does a partner have to take a little responsibility also? So what exactly does it mean to serve God? Yes, obeying is important, of course. If you're not even going to follow instructions, then you're, you're going to destroy everything. But it's got to be more than just obedience. An animal can be trained to be obedient. <clears throat> we are given intelligence. We're given freedom of choice. There's obviously more to us than obedience. In fact, that's why we often object to obedience completely. We don't want to be obedient at all. Because it doesn't sound like a human talent. So there's more to serving God than only obedience. Serving God means doing what God needed from you for which he created you. What is it exactly that God needs of us? What is it, what is it that we can do for which we are indispensable? To put it in simple terms, bring God down to earth. We are of the earth. So when we invite God into our lives, we are bringing God down to earth. That, that's our purpose. That's what God needs from us, to represent the earth and to make him comfortable with the earth, with his own creation. Obviously, you do that by making the world more like his taste, more like his preference, to make the world more godly so that God himself can be comfortable in this world. And why is that necessary? Because in any relationship, it's got to be voluntary. 
I can't demand you love me because then the love is the result of my demand and it's not even your love. So if I want you to love me, it has to be your love, not mine. So I can't create you loving me. Then there's no relationship. So God has to give us the free choice to love him or hate him. Then if we choose to love him, it means something. So serving God literally means doing for him what he needs and relies on us, uh, needs from us and relies on us to do. That, that's a lot of conversation. Now, how much of that can we do for God? Different people have different capacities. Moshe appointed leaders under God's instruction. Moshe appointed leaders. He appointed leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of tens, different layers, different degrees of responsibility and reach. Some people can take responsibility for 10 others. Some can take responsibility for 100 others, 1,000 others. Those who can reach a thousand, if they reach only 900, they're not living up to their potential. Those who can reach 10, but only reach eight, not living up to your potential. So that's a definition. But what is the method? How do I know, practically speaking, how much to push, how much to expect, how much to shoot for. We have to assume always. I don't know if I'm the one who's supposed to reach 10 or 100. I have to assume that I am not reaching enough people. No matter what the number is, I have to assume I'm not reaching enough. And that tomorrow I will reach more. If I'm cut out for it, I will succeed. If not, I won't. But I am going to try. Based on the assumption that there's more to do and I can do more. And it's a safe assumption because if God is giving you another day of life, it means there's more that you need to do than you accomplished or did yesterday. So it's a very practical, doable, reasonable approach. I'm done. But to figure out exactly what my potential is, that's risky. In every relationship, you have a good marriage, nice. Can it be better? Of course, it could be better. So make it better. How much better can I make it? Don't go there. Every day is an opportunity to make it better than the day before. When will I hit the ceiling, my, my outer reaches? When will I be? I don't know. Why assume? Why set a limit? More than yesterday. That is so reasonable. Because today is a day in addition to yesterday. So there should be additional accomplishment. Very reasonable. And that was the Debbie's method. Do more today than yesterday. That's all. It's not intimidating. It's not overwhelming. It's not unreasonable. If you could do this well, you can probably do a little better as also. So... Go for it. The guy who sets out saying, I will influence thousands. I don't know if that's a good idea. It sounds very ambitious. But what if along the way you realize that you can only reach 500? You'll be disappointed and you'll give up. 
reaching 500 people was a great accomplishment. Why do you want to ruin that by having false expectations and then being disappointed that you couldn't live up to your own miscalculations? So let's not do that. Today is better than yesterday. Tomorrow's got to be better than today. That is menschlich. Because it's idealistic and realistic at the same time. It'd be nice if you surprise yourself and become more better today than you expect it to be. You expect it to be better, but it turned out to be a lot better. Whoa, beautiful. That's kind of like a reward for your efforts. Those little surprises when you accomplish more than you thought you would. But the next day, just a little more than the day before. No illusions of grandeur. We want to thank Rabbi uh, Friedman for taking the time to join us this evening to answer our questions. Of course, this is a prelude to our upcoming course that you can sign up for. The link is in the chat. We want to thank Fran Marks for her super chat. Thank you, Fran. Thank you for your support. And um, Rabbi Friedman, how do we keep uh, a positive outlook like you're describing with all the uh, craziness that's going on in the world? How do we stay focused on our mission when there's so much uh, death, dying, and suffering that we hear about in the news every day? Knowing that, it, that it's not my job to fix the entire world, is reassuring. Uh, the need should not discourage, but encourage. The more you see the need, the more inspired you become to try. Today, the need is so obvious. If our job is to turn darkness into light, boy, do we have a job to do. Because the darkness has never been so all-encompassing. The confusion. The aimlessness. The lack of direction, the lack of leadership, it's never been so bad. And that's not an exaggeration. I think everyone could agree. We have never had such a crisis of leadership where everybody in every religion and every country and every organization and every, every, everyone agrees that they're disappointed in their leadership. Some are devastatedly disappointed and some a little less devastated, but very, very few people will get up and say, I have a leader you should all listen to. Come listen to this. Nobody. So the need is great. Where there are no leaders, we got to step in and do our part. So seeing the, the mess should really inspire us, not discourage us. And it's not like the world is getting worse. It's not getting worse. It's getting crazier. I think people are much more willing to be good, to be useful, to be helpful, to be supportive. Just don't know how. Of whom? Now, people used to say, you have to respect women. Men have to respect women. And we were all inspired. Yeah, 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 let's respect women. And then somebody pulls the rug out and says, yeah, but what's a woman? <laughs> this is not bad. This is crazy. If I don't know what a woman is, how, how am I supposed to respect women? I, 
I think people want to be good more than before. Nobody wants wars. Nobody wants ugliness. Nobody, nobody even wants competition anymore. We've had it. We really want to be good. And we don't know how to spell good. We don't know what it means. Good for what? Good how? Good when? Who decides what's good? We don't know. So it's not a matter of hating the world, it's a matter of having pity on the world. To be so lost must be terrible. So again, seeing all the problems and all the horrors that are going on in the world doesn't discourage you from trying to make it a better place. It encourages, because the need is so real and obvious. And what's really obvious is we really need to know why we're here. We've ignored that question for so long. What's the difference? Do your best, make a living, get rich, get famous, enjoy. That's not flying. Not flying. People have gotten famous, people have gotten rich, and they kill themselves from frustration. Because why? What for? What's the point? What's the point? That is the most intelligent question a human being can ask. You have a great theory. What's the point? That's intelligence speaking. Intelligence always wants to know. So what? What's the point? I can have a very good life. All right. And what's the point? Well, it's better than having a bad life. True. But what's the point? If we can't answer that question, then we know nothing. You want to live up to your potential of what? And if you live up to your fullest potential, well, whoopee, so what? So you'll go to heaven? What, 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 so what? Unless the world needs to become better, Unless the world is designed to become better, unless God is anticipating his world becoming better, making it better doesn't mean anything. You'll make it better, somebody else will make it worse, the cycle will go on, evolution will continue, eventually we won't be human beings anymore, we'll become something else. It's craziness. If there's no purpose, then just sit back and evolve. What are you worried about? You might become extinct. You will become extinct. It's the process. The dinosaurs didn't sin. <laughs> they didn't fail. They evolved out of existence. So, can't stop evolution. If you're going to be concerned, if you're going to say life has to be better than this, it's only because it was meant to be better than this. If it's not meant to be better, then who says it has to be? Who says it ever can be? There's so much wisdom that we've neglected with our secularities. The whole secular approach leads to meaninglessness. And that's why the campuses are the worst places in the world. Where secular education is at its highest, confusion is at its highest. We educated ourselves into nothingness. I think the motto used to be, when you go to campus, when you go to your university or college, don't believe anything. 
doubt everything. Be skeptical about everything. And then you will find the truth. What we found is that we don't know anything, we don't believe in anything, and we don't trust anything. And that's not a life. So yeah, we need to talk about these things. Four court, four sessions, five sessions, six sessions, tip of the iceberg. But we got to get started. We got to get Absolutely. the basics down. Hmm? Absolutely, I'm. Ho I hope that uh, everyone listening is um, is excited to join. I think that there's a lot to discuss. I know that Robert Friedman has a lot more to say on this topic. So if you want to go ahead and uh, click the link that has the, um, the the sign up link, so you can join us for a week uh, in a week from today. We're starting Monday night. Monday night will be our first session, and we hope to see you there. So if you want to go ahead and sign up, and then uh, write in the comments that uh, you just signed up, we'll give you a little shout out. We want to say thank you to S. Bug. Hello from Australia, Shosh. Thank you very much for your super chat. And of course, uh, Angelo Zap for your super chat. Thank you very much. And Fran Mark said, you're making, you've made me a better person. I think that's referring to Rabbi Friedman. So thank you very much, Rabbi Friedman. And we do have a, uh, some wonderful questions. One question is, Rabbi Friedman, that I think that uh, is a perfect question for you which is, how much free choice do we really have? Very little. If you didn't expect that as an answer. We have very little free choice. But we have free choice where it counts the most. Divine Providence makes all the decisions for us, which is as it should be. Like, if I'm buying a house, it's all predestined. Which house I'm going to end up living in. And, and, and that's a relief, because what do I know about houses? I'd much rather God decide. I'd much rather God make this, make this choice. So, yeah, go ahead. Guide me, move me, take me. Where do I need freedom of choice? Only in a relationship. My response to you has to be free. Otherwise, it's not a relationship. But which shoes I buy, which building I live in, where I travel, where I... I don't need freedom of choice. I'd much rather let God do the choosing. And he does. But in every context, wherever we find ourselves by divine choice, we have to make the decision of how to engage in this relationship. God makes you successful in business. What's your reaction in the relationship? Are you grateful? Do you acknowledge? Are you thankful? That's freedom of choice. So freedom of choice exists only in moral issues. Because moral issues is relationship. God asks you to keep kosher and you say no. That's a relationship problem, not a religious problem. There God gives you freedom of choice to accept him, to, to love him, to hate him, to believe in him, to reject him. In a relationship, your response has to be free. Otherwise, God gets no relationship. So, freedom of choice is limited to the arena of morality, but that's the only place where freedom of choice is necessary. I don't mind if God decides whether I should be rich or poor. Because I don't want to make that decision. I'm kind of biased. I don't want to decide whether I should live long. I don't want to decide if I should be born. See, these things I would much rather have God make the decision. 
but in my relationship to him, my reaction to him, how I reciprocate, it's got to be me, otherwise it's not a relationship. Hope that clears it up a little bit. Yes, thank you very much, Rabbi Friedman. Um, let's go to a question of how do we juggle all of life's responsibilities? The best you can. That's all anybody asks of you. Do the best you can. People who are highly organized can get a lot more done than people who are not highly organized. Do what you can, realistically, humbly, without exaggerating your faults, without glorifying your abilities. Be a mensch. Do as much as you can and never regret it. And then tomorrow you'll do a little more. But how do you balance it all? Life has many flavors and many, many dimensions to it. And you want to uh, enjoy all of it. To the, to the capacity of the ability that you have. I think the key is don't set unrealistic goals. Then you can handle everything you commit to. You can be responsible to your family, be, be devoted to a career, do well at your service in the community, And they all get done somehow. But if you set rigid expectations, the frustration will kill you. I will do a little better than I did yesterday in all the areas of my life. I'll be a little better father. I'll be a little better husband. I'll be a little better Jew. That's about it. If I'm a cobbler, I'll make a little better shoes. How do I know what Hashem needs from me every day? He tells us very clearly what he needs. He wants you to keep Shabbos, for example. He wants you to keep kosher. He wants you to uh, put on tefillin, and he wants you to light Shabbos candles, and he wants you to give charity. What don't you know? I think the question is, well, that, that he wants of everybody. That's generic. What does he want of me individually, specifically? Well, one of the indications indicators is where are you blessed you have more money maybe he wants you to give more charity kind of makes sense you're good at reading and studying well come on take a hint I want you to learn a little more Torah you're good at uh, social services you're good at helping people come on so you do all the mitzvahs, but you specialize in your talent. Where you are gifted, that's where you should put your greatest emphasis. If you fail at what you're not good at, that's one thing. To fail at what you're good at, <laughs> that's no good. All right, thank you, Laura Jones. 
Laura, jo Laura Jones Gardner for your super chat. Thank you for your support. And um, a little surprise that we're having a uh, little meet and greet on Wednesday night. So be sure to sign up for this course before Wednesday night. This course will benefit you. It'll bring you much more value than the cost of the course. So I'm sure you'll be happy uh, after this course is done with all the knowledge that you'll be gaining with Rabbi Friedman. Be sure to go ahead and click that link, sign up for the course, join us, join us for the four nights of learning, and uh, you'll be happy that you did. And don't um, somebody, I'm sorry. You can share this information once you have it. Absolutely. So become a, a leader of at least 10, maybe 100, if you have a good uh, understanding of, of social media, millions, you can affect millions. One good idea that is universal and a million people owe you thanks because you made a difference in their life. I got to tell you, the first thing that we put on TikTok when we finally decided to go on TikTok we put this very short I thought that says, if you raise your children, then you can afford to spoil your grandchildren. But if you spoil your children, you're going to have to raise your grandchildren, and you're a little too old for that. That's it. That was the whole idea, the whole thought. Millions of listeners, millions so easy so simple so true and it made a difference in the lives of millions this is the beauty of the internet so once you learn what you learn you're not going to keep it to yourself hopefully you're going to share it and sharing these days wow it's measured by thousands and millions. Tens? Nah, that was, that's gone. We're way beyond ten. So every person who takes the course will become an influencer. Not, not, not with a shingle hanging in, outside the door. But everyone will become an influencer. Of thousands. It's really, it's really necessary. The world needs direction. And whoever can offer direction, whoever can steer us in the right direction, eternally grateful. Thank you very much, Rabbi Friedman. I'm looking forward to the course, and I hope that you are too. Be sure to click the link and sign up before Wednesday night. Of course, it's starting on Monday, a week from tonight. But uh, be sure to get in early and hold. we'll hold your spot. And we have a special meet and greet for all those that sign up Wednesday night. So uh, we hope to see you there. Rabbi Friedman, thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, somebody mentioned that it looks like you're in the hospital. So hopefully that everyone will rehab. be rehab. okay. Rehab. And a rehab. Okay. So we wish you... Uh, you and your family, lots of uh, lots of gesund, lots of health and happiness, and may you continue to do your good work for many, many years to come. Amen. Thank you very much. And um, the world is getting better. We should all be able to say, "I did my part." That's that's a pressing issue. If the world becomes completely good and I haven't done anything to help, that's going to be embarrassing. So let's all chip in before the world gets perfect. You think there's a lot of time for that? No. It's happening very rapidly. I just don't want it to happen without me. So let's get to it. You got it, Rabbi Friedman. We're all there with you. Thank you very much for your time. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see you all later.